Howard Ward is Director of Growth Equities for the Gamco Global Fund. Howard, welcome to Street Smart. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Let, you know, the, the, the first thing I, I wonder about is the Fed, because a lot more people now, as Adam pointed out earlier, are looking for a rate hike this year. That can't be good for growth stocks. Well, you know, first of all, rates are so low that a rate hike from here is still going to leave you with the most expansionary monetary policy in history, except for the most recent period of time. So I wouldn't be too caught up with that. I mean, rates can go up a lot, and, and still stocks and growth stocks can do well in this environment. And secondly, uh, nothing's going to happen before the end of QE2. That's going to expire in June. When we get into July, if there is signs of a softening in the economy, and some people may make that argument, we're going to have fiscal drag, higher food and energy prices are, are upon us, consumer confidence rec recently turned down, housing is weak, may get weaker. If we get into July and the data is soft, I would look to Bernanke to reload, and we're going to see QE3. 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 You know QE3. what, this is a perfect time to bring in Adam, because w this is what we were hearing also last week. Adam, everybody was telling us QE3, and now everybody's talking about rate, rate hike. Well, and it's really, you know, it's five to one at the Fed. There are a lot of Fed governors, but it's really f the five that are being the most vocal. We're talking about uh, Bullard, Fisher, uh, Honig, Kacha Lakota, and Plosser versus Dudley, on the other hand. And all five are effectively saying we may already have done too much. We may not even have needed QE2. A very different tone from these five. They're hawks, as they like to say, guys who are saying we need to raise rates versus uh, Dudley, on the other hand. Bill Dudley of New York, who arguably carries the most sway next to Ben Bernanke, who says, wait a minute, steady as she goes. If you look at Fed funds over the past 20 years, of course, we've never been down here. I mean, that's no surprise. Look at that. I mean, we've been down that whole right side of the chart is just where we've been sitting now for quite a long period of time. And, and Howard, the question really is, how long can you have a Fed that is debating internally to this extent where you now have, just this week, five presidents come out and, and are very vocal about higher rates? You know, I really can't believe uh, the frequency of chirping I hear from these Fed governors from across the country. In 33 years of working We're thankful out, for it. 33 years of Wall Street, I have never seen anything like this. Every time I turn on a, a, a machine, I'm getting quotes from somebody in some part of the country. Uh, I'm not sure that's productive, by the way, but I think it's always wise to pay attention, much more attention, to what the Fed does as opposed to what the Fed says, particularly when the message is coming from someone other than the chairman of the Fed, who is Bernanke. And Chairman Bernanke, I believe, has, tends to have a more bearish view of the economy than the five hawks that are out there calling for rate increases. So I would sit tight and would not be losing any sleep right now worrying about rate increases this well, year. Well, and before today's jobs number, all we heard about was QE3. From the bulls, Barton Biggs came on and said, we're going to get QE3 uh, to the bears. We had David Rosenberg saying we're going to get QE3. Christy Romer was on saying that, although she probably is in favor of any kind of stimulus at any time. Uh, and then we had Bob Schiller saying we really may yeah. need it for the housing market here. Well, we may. I think one thing is pretty clear at this point. The political will for QE3 doesn't exist. And the economic, our economic argument right now is too soft to make it for now. So we're going to have to wait until the end of June and get into July and see what the numbers look like for the economy. What do you think about today's jobs report? I mean, uh, it seemed on the surface like a very good number. It was better than expected. On the other hand, uh, income not rising at all, really, from the month before, which is a depressing, a depressing statement on, on the whole labor picture, isn't it? Well, it's a mixed bag. I, I do think that the payroll number itself was a very solid number, particularly you had for private payroll growth, 230,000, revision to last month up to 240,000. The household survey showed nearly 300,000 for the second month in a row. We've had six consecutive months of gains in payrolls, three consecutive months of, of rising gains in payrolls. So I think we've got some momentum building on the labor side, and that's very important because we're moving into a part of the year here where we're going to have fiscal drag on the economy. You're going to have to have as many jobs as you can create to generate the wages to offset that fiscal drag to keep the consumer spending going. Remember, consumer spending, 70% of GDP. H Howard, so it's, yes. I, I wanted to, you, you were talking about wages, so I wanted to jump in on average hourly earnings, which did rise, but didn't rise as much as had been anticipated. So you have that one track on the one hand, the earnings rising sort of slow and steady. On the other hand, of course, you have inflation. You have all the commodities costs that are going up, costs for products that are going up. So what is going to happen with consumer spending? Because even if you have the jobs, 
does the pay have to be higher than at the levels we're seeing right now? Well, consumer spending is going to slow down. I mean, I'm fairly confident that over the next few months, you're going to see a deterioration in consumer spending. In fact, I think the most recent surveys on consumer confidence will bear that out. On top of that, of course, the, the higher food and energy prices, higher apparel prices. What's Cotton done in the last year? You can see a lot of apparel retailers raising prices. In fact, another, I think, will be doing that today. So uh, I think the consumer is going to pull back a little bit. We're going to be looking at some slowing in the rate of economic activity over the balance of this year, perhaps. And here again, we're going to get right into this argument. QE3 or no? And we're just not going to know until we get into the summer. Listen to uh, David Kelly of J.P. Morgan Funds. He likes what he sees out there. Listen up. It's almost a perfect scenario for the stock market where you've got an expanding economy, but because you've still got a lot of unemployment out there, wages are being held down. That's helping margins, and I think that that's a very positive sign for corporate profits. So, so what do you think? I mean, is it kind of, are we in a different kind of Goldilocks scenario here? Well, we are. There's a whiff of Goldilocks out there. And let me just throw you another curveball, because I don't want to sound like I'm too far on in favor of QE3, because I'm not. It's premature to make that statement. But if you focus on that household survey for payrolls, for employment, which tends to be more accurate at inflection points for the economy, it's telling you we've created twice the number of jobs that the payroll data has said since this recovery started, about 2 million as opposed to 1 million. And that starts to give you a reason to help understand why has the stock market been so strong? Why does it go up? Why did we hit a, a, a recovery high on the Dow today, intraday? The s and is within a whisker of it. What's going on here? Fact is, maybe the labor situation's better than we think. Maybe the profits that we're expecting are going to be higher. Maybe, maybe we're underestimating what corporate profits will be this year. And profits lead to employment. And employment leads to profits. We're not yet to the point where you get this sort of positive feedback loop going. But you can almost make the case for that over the next few months, starting if we can maintain a 200,000 plus level on payroll growth. Well, we certainly hope you're right, Howard, uh, or we hope that that's the case in any case. Listen to something that Julie Hyman has, uh, has pointed out. She's been looking into this. Julie Stocks getting no love from analysts, actually doing pretty well here. So maybe the analysts aren't looking at the right places. Well, this is actually kind of a longer term trend. This is something we tend to see pretty frequently. Uh, what we did is we created basically an index of stocks that are least loved by analysts, those that have no buy ratings whatsoever. And we looked at their performance versus the S&P 500. And take a look at that unloved group, the yellow line. It did a little bit better than the S&P 500. Uh, we're talking about eight unloved stocks here. It's an index of them. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway's B shares. Uh, we've got Cincinnati Financial, Duke Energy, Lucadia National, Masco, NICOR, Nice Source, and Sears. All of them included in this. Um, and Howard, I imagine this is sort of music to the ears of somebody who's a value investor, that you look for stuff that's not loved by the market. I mean, how are you sort of d deploying a strategy in the, the environment, the picture that you're painting right now? Well, if we focus on the S&P 500, first of all, I think you have to look over some period of years for these kinds of, of uh, analyses. Um, the S&P 500 is selling at 13 or 14 times forward earnings. And 10 years ago, it was double that. And during that period of time, during the last 10 years, the earnings on the S&P are up about 58%. 10 years ago, there's a distinction, right? You mean before or after the bubble burst? Late 99, going into 2000, the S&P was selling. So right at the top of the right market. At the, right at the top, S&P was selling at 26 times forward earnings. Now it's at 13 or 14 times. And during this span of 10, 11 years, you've had about 50, almost 60% growth in the earnings for the S&P 500, and the underlying index has done nothing. Actually, without dividends, it's gone down. During that same time, the Russell 2000 index, which is a small cap index, has gone up about 60%, as have their earnings. In other words, their earnings drove the share prices, which is what's supposed to happen. It hasn't happened for the S&P. I think that large cap stocks in general, as a universe, are very cheap and you can buy them with a throwing darts almost. All right, hey Howard, thanks very much.